Our plate. Oh, Ben, did we get our partners or volunteers? Okay. Want to thank. And pardon? The usual volunteers. Okay. Want to thank our uh, media partners streaming the show, wardsauto.com, DC Auto Geek, and Driven Mavens. DC Want to thank Auto. our volunteers monitoring the chat room, Mud Monster, <clears throat> Scotty in Cleveland, and DC Auto Geek. Want to get your questions for rapid fire? So mail them to viewer mail at autolinedetroit.tv. Call us at 1 620 288 6546. Uh, or go to bit.ly slash after hours. Uh, we'll be, yeah, I just turned that off. Uh, we'll be posting the video of the show shortly after the show. You can subscribe to the podcast at the iTunes store. Just look for Out of Line After Hours. It's free. It'll be up there tomorrow afternoon. You can also get this show and our other shows on your BlackBerry or smartphone via Stitcher. Go to our website at autoline.tv. Click on the Stitcher logo. It'll walk you through the paces. Use the promo code AUTOLINE, and you might win $100. And we'll get started here in a couple of minutes. I know I was talking to the hardest core Porsche guy I know is Jeff Swart. Yep. He's an old friend of mine, and, uh, you know, he's a friend of the factory. He's a, oh, yeah. a very accomplished racer. and uh, Takes passable photos, too. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, I actually gave him his first uh, Detroit automotive gig. Really? Also uh, enlisted him for his first commercial shoot. Cool. Motion shoot. But he uh, <clears throat> he likes the new 911, but he doesn't like the console. Really? Well, it's that it's that Virtu telephone thing that they started with the. Um, Panamera. Yeah, the Panamera. But I don't mind at all. I don't either. But I can see why people don't like it. It's it's a very polarizing thing. It's the ang angle switches. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Funny yeah, when yeah, I right. was in the mountains in Santa Barbara and it was pouring rain and I was going really fast, the console really didn't matter to me. Yeah. No. Funny, <laughs> funny how that works. I didn't even look at it. I was too right. busy. Hey, the dog has figured out, I think, how to push no. the door open. No, yeah, no. Ike, come here. Come. He wants the food. I don't blame him. Come on, Ike. Lie down. I don't like. I do yeah, like that car though. But it, it's pretty nice. And you know, the, the, we're seeing the, the tip of the iceberg with the 911 because there will be a GT2. There will be a GT3. Eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Auto Line After Hours is brought to you by Bridgestone, your journey, our passion, and by Chevrolet. The all-new Chevrolet Cruze. Get used to more. Well, thanks, folks, for joining us once again. I can't wait to get started on this show. Right, Peter? Peter DeLorenzo, folks. Absolutely, John. <laughs> <laughs> and for the show, too, we got Jim Hall from 2953 Analytics with us. Howdy, John. <laughs> Good auto show week here. Good auto show. Wow, we, that's what we got to talk about. I don't even know where oh, really? to start. There was, yeah, that's why we have you here. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, and you thought we were going to talk about, you know, movies. End cap. End cap rating. Oh, yes. Yeah, and not only that, specifically the Bosnian end cap rating <laughs> system. Could we just, you know, it's that whole thing about harmonizing end cap, and the Bosnian end cap is wrong. You know, you don't hit every car with a school bus. I'm sorry, that's not part of the requirement. Okay, let's get them off that track and back onto the auto okay. show. Quick, quick. What do you think, Peter? What, what stands out in your mind? Well, the first show? of all, it was good to be at an auto show again and, uh, instead of an environmental group hug or a political convention. Or a wake. Or a wake. <laughs> it's uh, been that for the last three years. Yeah, pick one. Yeah, pick one. And it was a real auto show. And uh, it felt like the auto business again. And, you know, uh, I had my significant cars at the end of my column. Uh, the Fusion is the most significant car for an, any number of reasons, and it's going to blow up the segment. Jim. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, we've already talked yeah, about this. Yeah, yeah, well, we've got to talk about it here because uh, I haven't heard this. Uh -oh. The uh, Lexus LFLC was the most signi significant exotic concept that will never see the light of day, but Correct. it's still influential. Right. We've got to talk more about that, and too. And drop-dead gorgeous. Yeah. Uh, the NSX was the most significant uh, 
car that's coming eventually. Don't bet on it. Yeah, but you know what? Fool me once, shame on you. Fool me yeah. twice, shame on me. Ooh, okay, I want to hear more about and, those too. But the thing about that, we'll have to divert right now on that because remember a few years ago, Detroit showed concept after concept because they didn't have their product cadence. They didn't have any production cars. So they'd show something and say, wait a minute, we're still alive, we're still hip, we're still cool. That's what the distinct impression I got from Honda when they showed the NSX. It was just like, oh no, don't count us out yet. But they had a chief engineer that spun up more of a story about it. The corporate chief engineer spun more than just that kind of story around it. That's why I say fool me once. Yeah. You know, and the car was also a waterline model too. What yeah, do you mean no. a waterline model? It's basically a large foam model where there's no full interior. Right, and right. we call them waterline models. They can okay. fill the interior. So, with I mean, they say three years from now, we'll see. And then my most significant concept for a whole raft of reasons and my best in show was the MKZ. Lincoln MKZ. Yeah, we, we can get into that because there's a lot to talk about that. What, what stuck out in your mind? Well, you know, when, when, when things just come, when you the think The one about that pops to mind, one, was how... How has Smart or, or Mercedes lost the way with that truck thing that they showed? Oh, I mean, man. good I lord. Just, I just, the Smart for us. I I'm just, sorry. I just blasted that. I, you uh, know, I'm we, starting to question Dieter's sanity now. Exactly. The thing, there's, there's, no, there's no context for it. It's, it's crazy. It would be like Mini bringing out a, a short wheelbase F-Series pickup and calling it, you know, the Mini uh, B Bedman or something. I don't know. The one that stands out is the car that a lot of people didn't expect there, the 700C. That thing blew my mind. Now, so anybody who didn't see it, it's a minivan, but it's a sort of futuristic minivan. There was no press announcement about nope. it at all. There was no press release about it. Was it was an auto at show at its best when, when we were all surprised yes, right. because we didn't get the heads right. up on it. No, I agree totally. I came around the corner and went, what the hell is this? You know, I forgot to mention my com. I thought it was really pretty cool. It was, it was the coolest thing Chrysler had there. Yep, and it's, it's a Chrysler show car that embodies that flamboyance that Chrysler show cars always used to have. Mm -hmm. Well, in, in sort of revisionist modern. No, but, uh, but the thing is, it's, it's that yeah. kind of flamboyant. Yeah, yeah. There are a couple of things I like about it. One, they're actually looking at a real issue, and that's that commoditized minivans are what they are now. Let's face it. Minivans are just a commodity. People don't aspire to them. They don't aspire to them. They don't want them. them. They don't want them. They the, buy them because they have to. The market's flat. So if you look at this as a flat market, and when, the, when Gen Y start getting to that child-rearing age, which is going to be later than it was for the Xers and later than it was for, Gen, uh, for, for the boomers, when they get there, they're going to have a lot of alternatives to a full-size or large minivan. Mm -hmm. A large minivan. Think about yeah, what yeah, I yeah. just said. <laughs> but they're big. You know, the things are bigger than Tahoe's. So if you want to have one and you want to sell it for something other than absolute bargain basement, it's a box you can buy at pricing, you have to do something to it to make it flamboyant to give it presence, and they did that with that vehicle. But the inside package is still a minivan. It's just the wrapper's unlike what you'd expect for a minivan. I heard that uh, the Chrysler people didn't even know that that was going to be on the floor until two weeks before the show. That it was a total surprise to everyone. In fact, I thought it looked more like a Lancia design. Well, that was the other thing vehicle. I was gonna say. Yeah. The other reason I like it is you look at it, because remember, Lancia and Chrysler are gonna converge their design languages, and it's a brilliant idea because in no market will both cars be sold. In Europe, that thing is a giant people mover that's a high-end sort of pseudo pope mobile almost in a way. I mean, think about it. That could be a high-end Lancia executive vehicle. Mm -hmm. And what you could do to the interior with that much space is pretty amazing. In a package that isn't quite as irritating or disgusting or badly proportioned as a Maybach. You know, and I, you wouldn't charge Maybach money for it, but the point is this car is really, it, 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 on a couple of levels, it's really intriguing. And remember that uh, the Dodge Caravan's going away, so it's not as if there's Only one to... brand is going to have a minivan. And That's if only, Chrysler. And, if, if only, and you got to make it premium. You have to do something so you make sure it does not go and start duking it out with basically Kia, the entry level, uh, the, you know, the, the other Japanese, the two Japanese vans that sell because they're not entry level, but you can see they're, they're more commodity vehicles every generation because the whole segment's getting commoditized. There's also, from a design standpoint, something really neat on the car when you see it. There's, a, there's more tumble home for the front doors than there is for the rear doors. Oh, I didn't notice that. And the way they transition it, it's this little interesting fillet surface that, that it's odd looking, but it is incredibly interesting to look at. The surface development on it is spectacular. And I mean, literally, of all the cars, it's the one that made me smile the most. <laughs> well, I smiled because to your point, I didn't know what was coming. Yeah. And uh, can you imagine if we went to an auto show where we didn't know anything that was going to be there? Wouldn't, Wouldn't that, that be, be the most fun of all? That would be great. Well, the last show that, that happened was when uh, Cadillac showed the 16. Mm -hmm. uh, but even they tipped it uh, two days before at that theater. 
Right. You know, so this, this whole thing about showing them on the stand, that's what auto shows used to be about. You know, but sure, that's when you're going to have all the photographers really shooting. That's right. when you're going to have people applauding. You know, I've, I've written about this extensively. Yep. These car companies just cannot help themselves. They have found, you know, just. Well, but but to, but the truth is the media has also induced it. we got to have stuff earlier. You don't get covered. Well, of course. But, you know, it's, if it's real news. You'll cover it. Yeah, it's real simple. If the, if the car companies grew a set and said, no, we're not doing anything. We're not handing out any little sticks. Come to the show. Yeah, we're not having a right. preview. Everyone's yeah. going to see it at the same time. Come to the and show. And you can choose to do with what you want to do with it. it and you know what? Best. If the car's significant, ain't nobody going to ignore it. Right. Uh, That's right. Okay, John, what'd you like? Um, boy, there's so much to talk about, too. Yeah, I agree. Uh, love the surprise of the 700C. I do agree. I thought that the Lincoln MKZ was probably the most significant, but by barely so. It's not a concept, though. That's the car. It, it Take is. the glass roof off. That's the car, and that's why Put I on some door handles too. Yeah, I, I mean, but it, that you know, the, the it's sole production. They shouldn't it is, call but, it a concept. And the car is amazing anyway. It really is. You know, it's the first. It'll be the first Ford product to have a push-button automatic transmission since the 1958 Lincoln and 1958 Mercury's. They probably won't be playing that up. No, they are playing that up. That is the first. Well, 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 they're, they're not mentioning those dates yeah. <laughs> because only you know that. <laughs> well, they'll, they'll show the production uh, car New York. in New York. Yeah. But the other thing is, I love the Lincoln display. I thought it was the best oh, display it, at the, the show. The Lincoln display looked like you could go in and buy something valuable for your significant other there, take it home, and they wouldn't go, oh, this came from an auto show. It had that look. Yeah. I mean, and those expanding. I want two of those from my yard, yeah. upside down, like trees. So explain those. So anybody, it's a I can't, sculpture. The there's I know the name of it, and I can't remember, but it's it's a lattice work that compresses down to a circle, and when it expands through a series of, of hinges and links, it becomes spherical again. Right. And they had LEDs over so it. So it goes from like maybe one foot diameter up to, to like, like, yeah, like seven or like eight, seven or eight feet. Yeah. yeah. The juxtaposition between the Ford exhibit. And the all-new Lincoln exhibit, boy, that was money well spent. Exactly. And you wander around in the darkness in the woods at the GM exhibit. It was just like, what is going on over here? Yeah. I mean, I thought the, the dark days were over. But, you know, Cadillac's dark. Right. Okay, great. And it was cars on a carpet kind of approach yeah, cars to displaying. On the carpet. Yeah, the, the thing with CAD in their defense was that, in my mind, they had some new cars there, but on the dark display, they had all these black and dark and dark colored cars. They should have used that to have cars that pop out of the background, and they didn't. It was just a disaster, and I, you know, I mentioned this and on the table. I mean, GM just, they have got to do something radical because well, they're starting no, to be left in the No, dust. I agree totally. In fact, I went to the eight, the Cadillac ATS intro, which they held at the old design and color yeah, studios, the, where Harley, building. the Argonaut building. Yep. We're, we're in this very historic place. There is Harley Earl's office right down at the end. But what, how does it start out? The chairman gets up and starts talking Just about, you know, oh, sales in Europe and sales in China and shareholder value. And I'm looking around and nobody here you know is for that. Shareholder value I think that's the word that that killed Jack Nasser. The phrase, yeah. okay? You got to be careful with shareholder value. Right. You know these. Well, the German executives are the worst. They're, they're the worst. I, I know. Mean, right. They need to get away from that. If they want to talk about that, they should hand it out to the media and have the executives there for questions. But don't do it at the presentation. Show us the damn car, please. Well, right. Come on. In the case of BMW, it's not like they were showing an important car. It was only the three series. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Right. Well, and, and also... Which, which kind of got lost in the shuffle. Exactly. Yeah. And, and that's a very significant but, but, car. But part of the reason is it's been on their website for probably two and a half, three months. Well, they leaked it's, photos yeah, weeks ago. That, that, that's the whole thing. That, that, and they needed to do that from a cadence standpoint because in Europe they're already they're, you know, they're, they're in sellout of the old car. So I understand the timing, but that means it's not really a launch except as a North American launch. But you know, this, is, this is the problem with global launching. We're going to get ours after the Europeans get theirs. Mm -hmm. Well, and the other thing is, is how about when Mercedes puts that magnificent 52 300SL race car next to the new SL? Guess what looked better? Guess what looked more contemporary? Stop. Guess what? You know, I'm sorry. Just because the new SL looks as though it was designed by a blind man, okay? <laughs> well... You know, I, I'm sorry, but Mercedes, from a design standpoint, is going the wrong way more often than the right way. Think about the first CLS, mm -hmm. the gorgeous sedan. Fantastic. You know, for, right. uh, for a number of years, it was the most beautiful Jaguar you could buy. 
I mean, it was. And lo and behold, they have the new one. Train wreck? Yeah, well, I, the SL's got so many slats, creases, folds. It's Vents. too big. Right. Mm -hmm. As I put on the site, it looks like it's uncomfortable in its own skin. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, you know, and then you see that beautiful SL. Oh, it's just stunning. And, and it was interesting that, you know. Someone told me, well, that's not going to be in the showroom next. So I said, what? <laughs> yeah, you're missing the point. Well, you know, maybe their point is they know it's ugly and the other ugly cars will make it look better in the showroom. I don't get it. Now, the funny thing is there's, there's a new Mercedes. I think the ML is a very successful redo. I really do. I think the ML works. Mm -hmm. But the CLS doesn't. Uh, I dread to think what they're going to do to the S-Class. To the I really do. The S class is that segment is going to be a segment where it's going to where the car that's going to be the walk walk away best looking car is going to end up being the A8. Could could well be. I love the A8. I, I do too, but I'm just saying yeah. it's it's going to get better as the other guys bring their cars out. You know, how often does that happen? And along with the '52 SLR, Honda had a 1982 Accord parked right next to its concept version of the next Accord Coupe. Oh, did they the have a, did they have a concept version of the next Accord there? Yes. <laughs> You couldn't tell the difference, right? Well, no, I saw, I saw the square light body kit for the current Accord Coupe. That yeah. was interesting. It, that, that 82 Accord came from the Henry Ford Museum. Yeah, it did, because yeah. it was the first Honda down the line yeah, in Ohio. It. But I thought, you know, that's how you make your concept car really look modern. You park a 30-year-old car next to it. That's still, I mean, it's funny, because I knew some friends that went over and looked at it instead of the, the concept. Because like, I haven't seen one of those in a long time, and they're looking at it and saying, yeah, you know, this thing in a lot of, and it's... Yeah, just uh, all kinds of zaniness in that regard. But uh, you know what? I'm wondering, should we take our first break right now? Nah, we got plenty of time. Oh, okay, let's, <laughs> let's talk about, um, oh, that was interesting for all you insiders out there. Um, Sal and Bingo brought Dan Ackerson over to meet me at, before the Chevy show. Is that right? Yeah, we had a nice chat. So just, just so you know. Uh, I wanted to like the GM concepts, the twins, well not twins. They're not twins. But the, <clears throat> but the little, uh, their version of the one series and then the... Uh, and the one series was the code, yeah, right? Yeah, the red car. No, uh, or is that the true? No, no it, was, true it was the white car. Yeah, it was the code 130R and the, the, you know, the, it's the 130 and the 140, period, end of discussion. Yeah. I used to say there's no such thing as a bad name for a good car. I'm reserving judgment on that. It may not be the case. <laughs> well, I mean, I, you know, I, Listen, I, I love design, you love design, you love design. I think GM's got tremendous talent. I don't think either one of those cars was emblematic of the talent they have. I thought the white car was interesting, but not interesting enough. And I thought the red car was interesting for about 10 seconds, and then the more I looked at, the less it got. The interesting thing yeah. about the red car is, though, right? Now let's think about it. Honda could build the white car. Front drive. Hyundai could build the white car. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, there are a lot of companies that could build yeah. that. But there are only a couple of companies on earth that could pull off that other car and make it actually work for what it's supposed to be. Design subjective. There's stuff I don't like in that car. But the, the point is, it's a car that connotes a car that there used to be a fair number of. I mean, it's a Datsun. You, you say a 1 Series. To me, it's a Datsun 510. Right. I thought 1 Series. And it's not going to be the 2015 Camaro in case you're No, wondering. no, not at all. But, you know, for a car under a Camaro that maxes out with a turbocharged 2-liter 4, that would be a hell of a great way to have a more affordable car that's fun to drive. But you know, now that GM's letting the touchy-feely masses design their cars, then they can just shut down design, right? No. After I sat through that presentation, well, I don't know if you read my thing, but it was just like they did this video thing, and they had all these young people, I want, I want a car that doesn't ask me to do anything and does everything for me. I want it. It was just like halfway through it, it says, I want a gun. <laughs> Was this the Chevy presentation? Yeah. I missed that. So oh, I, thank it was God I missed just it. just dreadful. Oh, man. Oh, well. The, yeah, I, it's I, funny because at that show, buried away on one stand was a car from 2060. Which was what? Oh, the little roadster? No. Oh, the, the Mi Ray? No. What? The, Honda, or the, the Toyota Fun VII. I didn't see that. Nobody did. AMOLED exterior skin. You can make it anything you want from the outside. You can basically have an RFID chip when you drive through the city. Advertising's on it. Cut your cost of ownership. The inside does no real windows. It's virtual imaging to see out of the car. Yeah, it but can be, the point is that that 
is a car. That's a machine, the likes of which is, is where the probably the second half of this decade or this century is going to be like. Yeah, except the problem with the Toyota is it was like wandering through a used car lot. I mean, they jammed through so many vehicles in there that at least you got to see the Lexus LF LLC yeah. on a little turntable, and there was some air around it. The rest of the Toyota yeah. exhibit was just, it's, it's like a parking lot. Plus, they had banners like about what their warranty yeah. or their son was just right. like, what, Blocking your what view, are they right. doing? Yeah. 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 But this thing was up against the wall. Actually, where the uh, the auto line used that that little yep, thing, it right. was behind that. Oh, really? Where that thing was. What are they hiding it for? It was a black car with a black background. But it's one of those cars you look at it, and it really is one of those things that says this is a possible future mobility solution. Uh -huh. And again, you know, it's Toyota that's looking at this stuff. General Motors has apparently an omnibus program about future mobility that is far bigger than a single car. I mean, it's it's pretty pretty. It sounds like it's pretty big. Um, not all companies are working on this because some guys are so concerned we won't be able to survive the next five years. Well, they are going to survive the next five years. Sure they are. You know. In fact, uh, the guys in this town are going to make record profits. Uh huh. And so one of those companies is going to feed another company. What yeah, it's got to be happier than the dickens oh, about yeah, what's well, going on. Yeah, absolutely. Chrysler's you know. bailing out Fiat. Like, yep. Like I said it would two years ago. Sure, because... I mean, I understand the, the critical mass purchasing. That's what motivated all of it. But the truth is, the profitability of cars in this market is so much better than Europe, and it has been probably, oh, I'd say since the teens. Yeah. Well, same with China. You know, oh, yeah. the thing I keep pointing out is uh, General Motors sells more cars in Asia than it does in North America mm -hmm. to the tune of, I can't remember, the like 40% more cars in Asia than North America, but makes five times the profit in North America than what it makes in Asia. Remember, though, with, with everybody dealing in China, the, it's a joint venture. you got to give half your profits away. You're lucky if you get half. The way some of them are structured, you don't get half. And, and when does the bell go off in China? Ding, ding, ding. <laughs> Thank you very much. We really enjoyed working with you. We are nationalizing everything. And if you have a foreign nameplate, there will be an 80% tariff on anything you sell in this country. Bye-bye now. Could happen. It could happen. I, I don't the, see the, it the happening. The only thing, not, not at this snapshot in time, but it could happen. And, you know, look, clearly China wants to dominate it. The only thing that's holding them back is the Chinese people don't want to buy Chinese brand cars. Mm -hmm. They want to buy the names that everybody else in the world wants to buy. Yeah. So, I think it's going to be a hard... Yeah, Chen Yang is kind of tough. You know, to aspire to a Chen Yang. <laughs> well, I want a Chen Yang. Or a Coda. You know, maybe they'll, they'll call them Codas over there. Yeah, uh, we'll see. All right, John, I think it's time for our first... Let's, let, ben, let's take our first commercial break. So another thing I saw at the show was the place was crawling with politicians yeah. and regulators. We had uh, Ray LaHood, the Secretary of Transportation, Stephen Chu, Secretary of uh, Energy, David Strickland, the head of NHTSA, Lisa Jackson, the head of the EPA, and then throw in a few governors and congressmen senators. and senators and a mayor, and uh, I couldn't believe how many people were. But it still wasn't a political auto show. <laughs> no, they were interlopers this time. Yeah, they were yep. interlopers, and they fortunately were just kind of shuffled through, and thank you very much. A PR guy that's been at one of the companies, I've known him for years, is there, and he says, you know, I want to meet with you. The problem is I'm sort of up to my elbows in regulators until 3 this afternoon. And I'm like, what? <laughs> Another uh, car that I thought was kind of interesting was this Falcon F7. Now, I, before anybody thinks of the Ford Falcon, this no. is like, you know, this mid-engine mid -engine, two-seat rocket ship. Built yeah. in Michigan. Yep, the easiest cars in the world to build. It's, you know, it's, it's like when you're designing cars at school and you get the project that's the sports car. Okay, it's easy to do. It's hard to mess up that. And it's hard to mess one of these cars up, but it's also really hard to make them work like real cars when you're a low-volume manufacturer. Yeah. But... You know, it's it's. But what striking. I liked is again, it was something else. I come around the the bend, and it's like, what the hell yep. is this? Yep. And again, to what surprises. we said, uh, surprises are good at auto shows. Yeah, exactly right. Because the the truth is, we we get so jaded anyway. We're expecting everything early. I mean, we start they start showing us stuff in in some cases in November, before the show. We're gonna have this here. We're gonna have this here. And it's like great. Okay. Yeah, they have the the early debrief of what we're gonna show, and yeah, I'd really love to see the car companies just do away with it. Yep. Just say, I guess you'll just have to see. But but no, you'll just have to wait and see. That would be great. And okay. you know what? No car, if it's from a major manufacturer, will get ignored, will become ignored. It won't be ignored. No. It won't. 
Cappy. Okay. Okay, let's go back to the fusion because Peter loved it. I thought it was pretty good, but you've got some issues with it. It's not that I don't I don't love it, but it's it, it's a very good car. It's a very very good design. It's just that I think I was expecting more because of all the hype. That's not what he told me at the show. <laughs> well, we'll get into that in a minute. No, I, I think I was actually expecting more because of the hype. Because mm -hmm. it was like, it's radical, it's a big change, blah, blah, blah. Right now, there's one radical midsize car, and it still is the Sonata. Whether you like it or not, that's the radical design statement of, of midsize cars with a pre-caved-in grill and all that stuff. But it's, So you don't think the Fusion's radical enough? No, 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 I'm not saying that, but it's not as radical as, as they were making it sound. Okay. Now, part of it is it was replacing in some ways, from the B-pillar back, the Fusion is one of the most conservative mid-size cars out there, the current Fusion. I mean, mm -hmm. it's pretty, you know, yes. you could use it in an insurance company commercial without doing anything other than just taking the badge off and people wouldn't know that it was Ford. The front end, was a, they did a good job on it. It's a nice driving car. I have no doubt it's going to be a nice driving car. They were smart enough not to put a dry dual clutch transmission in it, okay? Oh, it's a wet clutch? Because that's what I was asking somebody today, right. Uh, they're doing also a conventional automatic as well. <gasps> really? Interesting. Interesting. See, I thought it was a calibration problem, but I ran into some transmission Physics. guys at the show. Physics. Yeah. That's what one executive at a transmission company told me is that Ford is trying to defy science with now, a dry clutch The thing clutch is, I understand the advantage to dry clutches in theory, because when you've got a, 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 a wet clutch, you're moving the clutches in liquid, and there's a loss. There's, it's actually a, a, the equivalent of a pumping loss. You've got, you've got to move this stuff out of the way. I understand that. But the problem is the baseline that Americans are used to is a planetary gear set, torque converted automatic that can dis is best described as oozomatic launch, seamless launching. The best dual clutch on the on Earth with a, with a liquid dual clutch still can't do that. Yeah. You know? I still think when the Fusion hits the market, the Sonata will look tired and that'll be Oh, I, I'm not saying that, but the Sonata is still the radical design. One of the reasons it's going to look tired is because it's radical. The, the, the Sonata is so far out there that everybody that yeah, loves it... I don't it, think it's that far out there. The surfacing? I th well, the surfacing, it's all very good. I like it. I'm not it, saying but it's, it's, but it's, it's, for a mid-sized car, it's a pretty bold statement. Yeah. It's, it's a serious diagonal on it. The, by comparison, the Ford looks absolutely conservative. You know, and the other problem is that I, the, M, the, the MKZ is the Ford design story to me. That thing is spectacular. Yeah, that yeah. thing is spectacular. You know, I, I can't tell you how many emails I got, well, the Lincoln doesn't look that good to me. And it's just like, please. Wait till you see it on the street. Oh my gosh. That's what I said. Do, yeah. You know, don't judge it under the harsh lights on a st in static display at an auto show. Wait till it's going down the road and, and you know, it's, light. it's like the MKT and the Flex. It's different upper sheet metal pretty much entirely, which is good. So it's not the previous MKZ that was basically, you know, the front and rear four feet of the car were Lincoln. Plus and the interior is... Well, the interior is spectacular. Spectacular. Yeah. But and I think that's the problem, that when I see that car, and then they talk about the, they talk by comparison about the Fusion. To me, the Fusion is just like, I'm sorry. No. It's My only criticism of the Fusion, and I got to tell you, I love it. I think it's a great car. I think it's going to do great for them, is they did ra ra rip off Aston Martin. I mean, it is a very Aston Martin-like nose. But the other thing is the rear three quarter of the car, the, the side three quarter. Three, three quarter or, or a, a like, rear quarter. Yeah, but a, a rear, dead or on not three quarter, rear quarter. Okay. Rear quarter. Very busy. There's some lines there that I'm not sure why they tried to resolve they, it well, the way they did. Well, part of it was did. they had to set up the taillight graphic. That's part of it. They had to set it up. And that, that called for two of those things that I think you're talking about. Yeah. You know, as far as it looking like an Aston Martin, I don't think it does because Astons have fluted grills, but it's, it's a subjective call. The thing is, Bill Mitchell said it better than anybody else. <laughs> when, Ford is bringing, when Ford has the damned, uh, those awful Granadas, the first generation Granadas, and somebody said, well, you know, Fords look like Mercedes Benz and your cars don't. And Mitchell says, if you're going to steal, the object is to rob a bank, not a liquor store. <laughs> <laughs> which told you what he thought of Mercedes and right. better than anything else. Right. And I still contend that there's nothing wrong with someone looking at your affordable car and thinking of an expensive car. True. No, I agree. You know, that's I agree. Look, we're nitpicking, 55 right? Because, Chevy. Like I said, right. Because a lot of people hated it because they had a Ferrari grill on it. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> I'll tell you, well, let me just say when that first Fusion is unloaded off the truck in Omaha, it's <laughs> a pretty big deal. You know why it may not? It'll have 16-inch wheels, plastic wheel covers. See, we don't, they didn't have one car there with a, with a real base wheel tire package. And what's interesting is if you looked at all the Malibus we've seen have been Ecos. Mm -hmm. Okay, every Malibu we see driving around here, because you see a bunch of CTF cars, captive test fleet cars. 
Conversely, they had an LTZ on the stand. The LTZ's got 19-inch wheels that change. I mean, it's, it gives the car a lot more presence. We're seeing all LTZs on the stand. There. Yeah, but guess what? I mean, you'd ha you had you had to really look at the GM exhibit to find stuff. Oh, I know. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not talking about the exhibit. Yeah, no, I'm talking I know, about the fact just... that Ford is showing cars that are titaniums that are going to be priced in what used to be the Lincoln range, and they'll probably sell. Uh, dealer principals will get them for their wives, and there'll be some executives that get them. But it's going to be a low take rate car. We'll it will. See. We'll see. You okay. Because the, the market is not asking for a Ford midsize car for thirty five grand. I don't think that you can find any place where the market's saying, I want to spend thirty five grand. Yeah, no, nobody does. Mm -hmm. That's that's not where the market I'm, is. I'm, I've got a lacrosse out there that stickers for thirty six. It's just like it's a Buick though. I mean, it, it's yeah. not a Ford. The, right. to the, to the, it, there's a difference in perception of the brands. I'm not saying that it's a better or worse car, but it's there's a different of perceptions of the brands. Okay, well, as long as we're on that line, Buick Encore, their little baby version of the Enclave. It's not really a version of the Enclave. Well, I know it's not. Oh, I, but, well, but, it but can, that's its it, problem. Because it, <laughs> we were shown that car in a dome show. Remember, it had to be like six or eight months before they went on. Uh, they, they went bankrupt. Remember, uh -huh. they had a big design show, right. and you went to the studios. But it didn't look as good as what they showed this year. Or you this know what week. you just said to me. He's the healthiest man in intensive care, because it looked like the glamorous potato without the glamour when we saw it. It was, and it was, yes. it was just. And I had a friend ask me, say, "Well, what do you think of the production car after I got out of it?" And I said, "Nice interior." And he goes, "Yeah, what do you think of the car? Nice interior." Yeah. I'm sorry, the outside of it is trying to force design cues on a car that size and proportion don't carry it. And when I see that car, what I see is a car that would play really well in Korea or China. Ooh. I don't mean in a bad way. Yeah. We're getting it. Mm -hmm. But in a way, that's no different than, let's say, for the sake of argument, um, Scion selling an IQ in this country. That car doesn't really fit in this country. It it's doesn't have the presence the new Escape has. No, the, 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 the Encore, no, it doesn't. You know, that's a, that's a good comparison. I, I saw new a escape. captive fleet Escape the other day. You and, spot him. And I'm telling you, that car is going to be hot. It's going to pop. Yeah, yeah that, no question that about it. That vehicle is going to be hot. But, but you see, the thing that concerns me about the Escape is size, because the, sec the segment Centroid now has moved to the Equinox. And the Equinox, from a package standpoint, is appreciably bigger than, I mean, it is. And, and it's that whole thing about when people are buying a utility that size, are they going to pip the fact that it's got more room or fill in the blank? The, the problem is the last Escape, while it had the, the look of an appliance, was a spectacularly good package. It really was. And it's why they it's were able to... selling like crazy. Exactly. That's well, why they were able to they, sell it for well, as long as they did. They've been piling on incentives, incentives at the end of the year. But they will sell the Escape, believe me, on the name a lot. Right. Just like the Explorer. I mean, people have grown accustomed to names. Yeah. Did and Encore, on? I mean, I remember Encore. I just wondered why they didn't call it Alliance. <laughs> the Alliance. Okay, remember Encore. the Renault Alliance? Oh, yeah. oh, oh, the oh, Renault that's Encore. Right. Yeah. Take a Renault Alliance, oh, turn it into yeah. a bubble back hatchback, and you have an Encore. That's, that's right. That's right. You know, I suppose the performance model they'll call GTA. <laughs> okay, Chrysler exhibit had the Dodge Dart. What do you guys make of the Dodge Dart? Go, Peter. You know, I just said they're present and accounted for in the segment. Uh, Reed, Which they haven't been for yeah, one generation Reed of Bigman product. Reed Bigman got up there, and I, and I thought for a moment I was at a, a muscle show because he was preening and doing his bodybuilding stances, and I was just like, what the hell? But anyway, <laughs> and there's a lot of noise, and they bring the car out, and it's just like, uh, yeah, okay, they're representing the segment. I wasn't wowed by it. And all the little Chryslerites out there, you know, did another uh, voodoo doll of me and hung me in effigy somewhere. But I don't care. They're represented in the segment. Didn't blow my mind. I, I think the design in the car is actually, it's, 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 it's very good. And it's surfaced unlike anything out of Chrysler in a long time. The surfacing on it is absolutely A1. They've got little tiny tweaks on the car that other manufacturers wouldn't have done. And they probably wouldn't have done, but somebody thought about it. It's like the DLO, they kick it up a little bit at the end. Mm -hmm. Normally, you take this line, and it would extend the window line if you ran it straight forward instead of notching it. But they do it. It makes the front quarter more interesting. Um, I, I think it's going to do a lot better. The car, I think, on paper, has everything they need. They offer for economy a dual clutch, but they also have smooth shifting automatics that Americans seem to like. They've got manuals. The, draw, the powertrain's interesting that they're using the 1.4, uh, the high output 1.4 for the economy model. It's going to be interesting to see how it drives. So what did you think? I thought it was pretty good. I mean, it's, uh, 
I, I pretty much agree with you, Peter. You know, they got the box checked for having a competitive subcompact car. Um, I was compact, isn't it? Isn't that compact? Or compact? I, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, no, 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 no. You're right. No, no, no. Anyway, I, I'm pretty sure you're right. No, compact car. You're right. Uh, Craig Cole, you know, on our staff here, did something interesting. He superimposed an Alfa Giulietta side view on top of the Dodge because mm -hmm. I thought they were identical. You Ooh. know, the Chrysler people had said, "Oh, it's longer and it's wider." The Dodge Dart is. It's got a deck lid, but. It is significantly longer. Yes. S slightly different wheelbase, yes. not by much, maybe an inch or so. It's about, yeah, it's about, about, but, about an inch. But the Dart has got to be at least a foot longer than the Giulietta. It has, you know, the Giulietta is basically a crop back hatchback, doesn't mm -hmm. have a trunk. Right. Uh, the interesting thing about, and this is all the nuances of these media conferences that the people out there don't understand or that they're not there, so they don't know. Chrysler has made this transition now to everything they touch is gold. And I thought that the, the Dart presentation was definitely coming from that position. I mean, we're good, we're hot, we're this, we're that, and here's the latest in our, in our brilliance. And it was just like, okay, it's a nice car. Well, the, the point with the Dart is that I think I like it more than you two guys, but the, the issue with the Dart now is that part's done. That's cooked. The car's cooked. We know what it looks like. Whether it's great or not is subjective, but now they got to build them well. I'm not convinced their dealer body can sell that car to the... To yeah, but the, I, I can... Well, here's the thing. Can, it's going to do better than the Dodge Caliber. Well, yeah. Oh, in fact, I fearlessly, going, I fearlessly so. predict they'll sell 5,000 more than they sell <laughs> Calibers, you know? I, I, yeah, but, but, the, but the point is now they have the hardest thing they have to do because now it's marketing. They've got to make sure that, one, you know they have a car in the segment. Two, that it is... It's a noteworthy car in a lot of ways. I mean, the truth is... Put a Dart next to a Corolla. We're not talking about, I'm talking about from a product attribute standpoint. And the, the Corolla is bulletproof, but the Corolla is also just as dull as a bag of hair. And that's an issue that the Dart probably isn't going to be dull, I suspect. You know, they're starting with good DNA by using the Giulietta. That, that's a pretty nice car from a ride and handling standpoint. So I'm assuming they wouldn't let that get too screwed up, but now they have to build them well. They have to have engineered it in a way that it's easy to build well, because as you know, that is really where a lot of the problems are. They have to have materials in it that will not have that problem that after a year, like a caliber, a caliber interior after a year was like most other cars after about six years. And that now they've got to do the hardest part. They have to market it, sell it. They have to support it. They have to make sure when they build it, they build it with rear brake caliper uh, pads in there. You know, I mean, <laughs> right. that is just a whole other issue. How do you build a car without brake pads and nobody notices it until it gets to the customer? That's astonishing. Yeah. That's right. And how about, how about finally, in the last 36 hours, the multiple mea culpas that the great Sergio has thrown out at the Automotive World Congress? I was incredibly naive about the Fiat sales numbers. Hella frickin' Louia, Sergio. I mean, I've been writing this for months, and I've been crucified, but oh, he's dealing around those, he's got an ax to grind, Sergio. No, I got an ax to grind when it's stupid. And he was stupid and relentlessly so. His ego got out of hand. And he's, well, he's still saying, well, we're going to sell, what, 6 million Chryslers in 20, what is it, 2014? Well, combined, Fiat Chrysler. Fiat Chrysler. Chrysler. And even finally the analyst said, well, time out, Sergio. <laughs> you need to just sit down and not talk for a while. Okay, so finally he admitted, yeah, I screwed up Fiat. But the thing with Fiat, Fiat was one of those things, there were aspects of it where you could see coming. They launched the Mini for almost 11 months before the Mini went on sale. They were doing an aggressive guerrilla marketing campaign on a national basis. They actually were. It was serious. One. Two, they launched the Mini in an economy that was just booming and expanding. And here we are with the 500. The only pre-marketing they did was that Chow Cinquecento uh, USA site. I said this a while ago. They did not establish a reason for Fiat's existence in the U.S. They didn't bother doing that. They just thought everyone would, would think Vespas and sweaters tied around their necks and nice Italian sunglasses and they're going to buy a 500. It doesn't work that way. It just doesn't work that way. And Sergio admitted, oh, I picked that number because it was uh, a couple thousand more than many. I mean, how can you run a car company like but, but that? But the point is, how could you pick that when you have, you're launching in a bad economy? And not only that, it's, you know, if, if this, this is a car where you're selling to people who are price sensitive to a degree. So you're selling a car at the bottom third of the market. 
in a bad economy. Common sense tells you it's going to be tough to duplicate what a company that was established in an exploding economy was able to do. Well, also he said, I'm, I'm insisting on exclusive dealers, insisting on brick and mortar, insisting on dealers spending real hard cash. And I heard from a, a very top dealer in California, Chrysler Dodge Jeep dealer, and he said, yeah, we all know Sergio blew it. All he had to do is take the top 10 Chrysler performing dealers in the country and allow us to sell Fiat. And he might have gotten halfway to his number. He said halfway. But no, we got to have a separate dealer network for a car that, you know, it's okay. It's cute. It's a niche car. It was the car of the summer. It's over with now. It's funny because the, the idea was they would also actually use those for the Alpha dealership I get, as well. I get and what's that. interesting is apparently it looks like Alpha is on hold until they do the transition to rear-wheel drive platforms for Alpha. Stuff. Oh, no, no, Sergio said. End of 2012, guys. You spend money on that brick and mortar and you'll be swimming in Alpha product. It's not going to be till 2014 now. If I'm some of those dealers, I'm just like, you know, this isn't good. It's going to be tough to hold on. No question about it. Uh, Here's the question, though. What other vehicles should go in, a, in an Alpha show or a Fiat showroom? You know, I can understand selling the Doblo there, mm -hmm. the little minivan. I can understand that. Mm -hmm. But the car they should be selling out of that dealership is a car Fiat doesn't build at all anymore. The Barquetta, a small, affordable convertible. Mm -hmm. The Barquetta's gone. They don't even do it for the rest of the world. But that's a car they should be selling. And then you have these character-filled sort of serious Italian passion vehicles you could be selling there. And that could work as a bridge if they had the right three or four cars from a dealer standpoint to keep the, the, the volume there until they get alphas. But right now, that car isn't even in the pipeline. Well, I can no, say there's right. no reason for being for Fiat in this country. And that, by the way, that Gorilla, gorilla campaign for Mini was genius. I know. And, and it was a once in a lifetime ad opportunity that was executed to the nth degree. Yeah. None of that happened with Fiat because also Cover of weekly world news. Also, by many. Sergio, in his wisdom, decided uh, we're not going to give any money for the launch. You know, so let's, they just blew it. So I'm glad he's finally admitting it. Hello, uh, Chip. Uh, uh oh, up. Oh, we're getting ready Chip for has a bunch of stuff. Uh, there, we we got a, a very special announcement to make uh, coming up after our next break. And Ben, why don't we take that break right now? The Chevrolet Cruze is the car that is taking the world by storm. And a key reason is all the equipment that it offers. A driver information center, a USB port, ambient LED backlighting on the dashboard, remote start with a MyLink app, two accessory power outlets, one in front and one in the back for the rear passengers, on-start, turn-by-turn directions free for the first six months. Whew, there's just too much to list here. And you can check it all out at Chevrolet.com slash cruise. Okay, uh, before we get into rapid fire here, we just wanted to give a shout out because uh, apparently a show or two ago, somebody mentioned that you can't get good pastrami here in Detroit. And so a box showed up from Katz's Deli. In Manhattan. In Manhattan, New York City. And uh, it's like a care package. What do we got there, Peter? Well, we have hard salami. From Katz's themselves. From Katz's, yeah. yeah big I mean, box. it's their own we salami. Have this unbelievable rye bread. Oh, yeah. Gigantic loaf. We've got special pickles. Uh, Corned beef. Pastrami. That, uh, that there be pastrami. Look at that. Yeah. Nice little pickling. Would you like a fork, Jim? Yeah, I would, actually. Oh, yeah. yeah. And we've got these potato things. Can so the, the folks at Katz sent us a nice little note that says, Dear John, Peter, and the rest of the Autoline crew, we love your show and listen to it regularly. Enjoy these treats from our restaurant. Robert, Kathy, Fred, Kevin, Alan, and Jake. Thank you so yeah, much. Thank you very much. That was <laughs> and and very, Ike the dog is sniffing this out intensely, but he's not going to get any of it. Very nice. Boy, yeah. howdy. It's really cool. Is it good? i got to try that. That's pretty darn good pastrami. Yeah. Okay, now it's time for rapid fire. Rapid fire. Okay, uh, Cloud Todd Blasa. <laughs> I know Cloud, uh, Claude, Claude Todd Blasa. Oh, Claude, Claude yeah. Todd Blasa, yes. Uh, says, you said the 58 Lincoln and Mercury were the last Fords with push button shifting. You meant Mercury Edsel, though FOMOCO would prefer you didn't mention Henry's son. The only Ford Fusion transmissions, at least for the IC cars, 
our six-speed manual with a 1.6 liter EcoBoost and six-speed automatic. Yeah, planetary clutch or planetary torque converted automatics, the way God intends automatic transmissions to be. Okay, Prehistoric says, in Sergio's press conference, he heaped praise on the upcoming Jeep Liberty replacement, saying it will be his best accomplishment. Any details about the new Liberty? Um, it's based off a front drive platform, but it has been Jeepized. He also I mean, quite literally. It's, it's they, you know, they, 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 the Jeep criteria that they need for Jeeps, they decided they were going to go ahead and do. First of all, Sergio needs to stop talking about his next best accomplishment. <laughs> <laughs> and also, uh, he kind of hinted that the Liberty could be built in China because they are looking at building a Jeep in, uh, in China. He said it would never be the Wrangler. No. But he kind of hinted that well, the it, Liberty could it, be it. It would make sense because they can also do a PF derivative for China. The, the PF is the neon. They can do a Chrysler PF derivative if they wanted to, mm -hmm. PG, if such a vehicle existed. And the uh, platform commonality with that and the Liberty, theoretically, there's a lot of commonality in the way they build. So they could build them in the same plant, methinks. Okay. DC Auto Geek says, any thoughts where the Taurus goes? Well, the Taurus just stays where it is, right? A, they're going to have to get to a more efficient package because, as you know, they have this very tall car that it, they, they lowered the roof on to make it swoopy. So they have this very tall car with a bad rear seat. Mm -hmm. They're going to have to fix the package on that car in the next generation. They can't redress it one more time because, let's face it, we're getting a 500. The Tauruses are 500 with a heavy reskin and some good mechanical work to it. But they've got to do more work on it. Greg says, I'm one of those people who sent you a note questioning the pre-show superlatives about the MKZ Infusion who were less than blown away when we saw the pictures. Nice looking cars, yes. Blowing the competition out of the water, no. Since there seemingly are a bunch of us who feel the same way, I am moved to ask, how can you explain the rather extreme difference in viewpoints? Well, I, I, What's your question? Yeah. Well, you know, I, I'll answer it. This is why my mother always said, that's why they make vanilla and chocolate ice cream. I mean, I agree with them that the, the, the more mundane of the car is the mundano. I'm sorry, the uh, <laughs> Freudian slip, the, the, the Fusion. Um, but I think the, the MKZ, I mean, you look at who its competitors are. MKZ really possibly ATS at the ragged edge, but Audi A4 and Lexus ES. Oh. Yeah, okay. Okay, uh, hey, we got a of number of uh, phone calls. Ben, let's bring in the first one. Hey guys, it's Jonathan out in Old Japan. Listen, I just wanted to touch base, ask you what your opinion is of the 2013 60th anniversary Corvette that was released with a 427, 505 horsepower motor, fiber, you know, carbon fiber this and that, the black headlights, got a power to weight ratio of 6.64 to 1, um, should do 0 to 60 and 3.8, 11, 8 and a quarter. Uh, is this an indication that General Motors is on target to deliver a C7 Corvette that really blows the mind of all sports car enthusiasts and Corvette enthusiasts? Again, I'm loving it. I'm digging it. They should have released it at the show uh, yesterday or the day before. The 60th but, anniversary. Uh, good to know it's out there. It's coming. And it's really the first time that General Motors didn't do like a decal package for the anniversary edition. And as a Corvette enthusiast, I'm very excited about it. God bless America. Well, in a way, it is a decal package because what it is is a Z06. Well, it's the, it's the first time they've offered a convertible with all the good stuff. Right. And but that's it, significant. Yeah. And they did a nice job on it. And they also announced that the 2013 Corvette is the last of the C6s. And, uh, you know, I grew up with uh, riding in fast roadsters, Corvettes, and Cobras and stuff, so if, you know, that's a pretty attractive package with the Z06. It's basically a Z06, it's a Z06 convertible. convertible, yeah. Yeah, so in a way, it, what I'm saying is, in a way, it is a decal package in that they took stuff they had in the system but the and just sort of regen it. But the anniversary is over and above that. Right, I know, because it has more, it, well, it's, 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 the, it's, a, it's a Z06 with the carbon package plus it's a convertible. Right. Yeah. But again, that's the, the great thing about the Corvette. They have this toolbox, this box of components that they can cook. The fact that they were able to pull the Grand Sport out by saying, well, we'll take this stuff from the Z06, we'll do it with an automatic, we'll do it with this engine. Yeah. That's the strength of the Corvette. I don't know what to say to Jonathan about what, what that indicates for the C7 because, you know, we'll just... Well, the thing is they'll be back to square one with the C7 because they'll have a new parts box. Mm -hmm. And they'll have to get some time to do all the variants. Right. 
Mike DeWhite says, why do push button transmissions? Is there any ergonomic benefit? No. No, there's, there's no ergonomic benefit for an automatic. The benefit is that you clear up space on the console right. and, and room on the center stacks and the consoles of cars is at a premium. That's why we had the rather astonishing BMW 7 Series with the steering column shifter, the old column shifter on the last generation. And it's why Audi, BMW, and now uh, Chrysler have moved to an electronic shifter where you don't move it as far as you would normally track a, right. a regular but, but shifter. But think about it. You don't even need a lever no. if it's all electronic anyway. Exactly. I, in fact, I got to believe just as everything's going push button ignition switch, that soon everything's going to go push button transmission. Not manuals. No, not them. <laughs> <laughs> okay, can you imagine? Clink, clunk, clunk. Put the clutch in and shift. <laughs> J.D. Clough says, that Chrysler 700C looks like a PT Cruiser from the back. Yeah, sort of. Yeah, I, I guess sort of. A sort of. I guess sort of. I mean, yes, it has okay. tail lights and a, and a rear Scott in Cleveland, for Jim Hall, is GM serious about the code 130R, or is it just a concept that will be forgotten? Well, as soon as all the touchy-feely hordes get done at, at telling GM what that car will be, then they might know that. I suspect... We're going to see him build that car, but not with the 1.4 liter engine they talked about. It may have that as the base engine uh, turbo, but the, the performance engine will be uh, less than 270 horsepower, two liter turbo. No V6s. And my guess is they're going to do it so they can raise the price ladder slightly on the next generation Camaro to around 26, 27 instead of 24. And plug this thing in at 20 to 24. Me, mm. me thinks Jim has some inside info. <laughs> no inside info. <laughs> Uh, comment from Dr. Botox. He says, what's your guess for the 2012 sales in North America for the Fiat 500 Abarth? He says, I'll say 7,000 units. Boy, that's optimistic, I think. Yeah, I don't think it'll do 7,000. You, you, you got to understand that you're talking about a hardcore group of enthusiasts that get up in the middle of the night and go downstairs or whatever they do to get on the internet and say, that's what I want. That's maybe 2,500 people. Plus the Abarts are all, uh, they're all manuals, aren't they? Yeah. And you see, that, that was one of the things. When they, when they decided to add, because the Abart is not a John Cooper Works compared to a Mini. It's a Cooper S, 160 horsepower. You know, so, I mean, it's, it's the, the upper-level version. But when Mini decided to throw an automatic behind the Cooper S, that's really where they got some legs to it. Manuals only, even in that segment, are a little bit of the pie. So you look at you know, total people that want a 500, then how many want a manual and how many want to spend the money? And you've cut that pie relatively thin. 7,000 is actually probably more than two times as much as where the natural market is for the vehicle. Hmm. Single hey. body style, too. That's the other thing. Right. Okay, uh, we've got another phone call here, Ben. Let's bring it in. Yes, this is Atlas King from Geneva. Uh, I talked to Jim once, and he went on and on about how good uh, wet clutch uh, dual shifts are and uh, dual clutches are and how bad the dry ones are. But the uh, transmission that he seems to like in the dark, isn't that a, uh, a dry clutch? I'd just like him to clarify that for me. Thank you. Sure thing. Thanks for the question. It's not true. The transmission like in the dark is actually the manual. <laughs> That's the one I like. And, it, and, the, and that is a dry clutch. Yes, that, yes it, is a, it is a dry clutch, but there is but one clutch. Yeah. And I also think that the, uh, the six-speed is probably going to be pretty good in it because that's a candidate that's going to be getting the, the eight-slash-nine-speed transmission. The, the Dart is one of the candidate cars for it. Mm -hmm. But it's the second, you know, because the, there's this, there's a race for gears and transmissions, and Chrysler's there. Chrysler may have the first nine-speed out of the domestics. Mm -hmm. um, but they're also, you know, they got... But is the Dart a dry or wet clutch? Automatic? The dual clutch is a, wet, is a dry clutch. It is. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting because that's only available with the Eco model, the 1.4 turbo, which they're doing for the 40 plus mile per gallon. Mm -hmm. So they're doing it as an efficiency transmission. And you can get it with a manual, but you can't get it with an automatic. So the price of the efficiency car is a, um, a mechanical launch, let's say. Okay, Mitch W. says, do PR people at the car companies pay attention to comments on Internet sites? Uh, yes, they do. Yeah, they do. In fact, they have people whose job it is just to, to go through all that stuff. And beyond PR people, marketing people, too. Yeah, yeah right. they have, they have in, uh, hordes of entry-level people who do that all day. Yep, yep. So there you go, Mitch W. Chris in Baltimore says, I noticed there wasn't an MKZ badge on the concept. Given the heat Lincoln has gotten for the alphabet soup names, does anyone think there may be a name change before the production model is introduced? 
I'd be surprised. No, they're, they're, it's they're, not going to happen. No, no. They're, they're living with this. And yeah, the, the one thing they didn't do, they didn't turn the name of the Navigator. The Navigator one time, I guess, was the MKN. At, for about 80 seconds, they said, bad idea. But it is interesting that Cadillac went to alphanumerics, or just new alphas. Uh, Lincoln went to them except for their utility vehicles, and their utility vehicles kept their names. Yeah. Well, I believe that at some point in the future, they will go back to names. Of course they will. <laughs> yeah. I mean, they, they, and Cadillac will too. At some time in the future, they're going to start naming Cadillacs again. And well, somebody will just, say, hey, we got this idea, a car called an Eldorado. Yeah, it just doesn't seem right without an Eldorado or a Continental or a, a Fleetwood or something. You know, it just doesn't. I, I, but the thing is, I agree with Eldorado, but Continental got slapped on everything there for a while where they really depreciated the value. Well, yeah, but it would be way long enough. Right, exactly. And it, but it needs to go on the right car. It really does need to go on the right car. Right. Okay, we got another phoner. Ben, bring it in. Hey, A-team. A-team's on, on staff tonight. Hey guys, this is Youngblood from Cleveland, Ohio. I just wanted to call and uh, wish you guys a happy new year. And when you were giving out the presents or the lumps of coal last year, as a uh, all-time or long-time viewer of your show, I'd like to give you guys a present for the job you do. Especially, you know, the A-team that's there now. How you, uh, like Peter when he did it as captain, that was fantastic. And Bob, uh, I mean Jim Hall when he was uh, playing around with his brother uh, Bob, that was great. I mean, it's amazing that you guys can have fun while you do such a fantastic job. So I give you guys a present. I don't know what that might amount to. might amount to a free happy hour on my tab along with lap dances. Yeah, why not? That sounds like a good time. Boy, would but, I be in trouble uh, with that. I had that. a question. Uh, I go to the Detroit Auto Show every year, and there's always one show or one display that's in a corner someplace that doesn't get much attention, but it's fantastic. Every year I've made it a point to find that one display. It might be a, a, a manufacturer's engine technology or somebody out of the blue, but I mean, it's always there and I make a point to find it. Did you guys find anything this year that you can direct me to that was fantastic and it's out of the normal? Again, Happy New Year and you're doing a fantastic job. Keep it up. Talk to you later. Bye. Thanks. Yeah, young, thanks. Thanks, young bud. Well, I think yeah. Jim mentioned that that futuristic Toyota. That's mm -hmm. one thing. But the, the the display that's interesting when you actually walk through it and look at it is the Lincoln display. Absolutely. It really is. And they they have they have these little things of, of items that are that are not necessarily it's not like they're showing Fabergé eggs, but they're things that from a design standpoint have a premium nature to them. I mean, it really is an interesting sh display to walk around and look at the cars too. Right. Um, in a way, it's a display that was let down by the fact that they had things like the, the facelifted MKS, which it needed, but they only got half the facelift, right? They didn't do the rear, which it still needs. The MKT facelift has helped the car. Um, it's almost like those cars were not worthy of the rest of the display, because the display is it's a spectacular display. Yeah, it's really good. Austin from SC asks, what do you think of Toyota falling to fourth place in sales last year behind GM, VW, and Renault, Nissan? I didn't realize they had dropped to fourth. Is that right? Capacity. It was capacity issue. They just got so kneecapped for some of their core product. I mean, the earthquake and the tsunami. Yeah. I mean, let's let's not. Uh, yeah, that was a one-time deal. But here's the other thing I keep saying is uh, Volkswagen, man, they're the monster. Oh yeah. GM may has be selling more cars, but Volkswagen Group brings in more revenue and makes more profit. Yep. And isn't that what a corporation is supposed to be all about? Well, you know, that's the whole thing of this argument about market share and so on. No, what you want to do is have profits and profit for everything you sell. And you do that, you know, that's how you stay in the business and that's how you keep making good vehicles. That's and right. by the way, I, I really like the Q3 and I really like the S5 RS. RS5. RS5. Yeah, the RS5 is one of those cars that fits in the category of I could take it or I could take it. Yeah. yeah. We've got another phone call here, Ben. Let's bring it in. Hi, this is Renzo Bandini from Elkhart Lake, Wisconsin. I was noticing in the coverage of the auto show that uh, GM had a few two-door concepts, uh, one based on the Chevy Cruze and another one, I believe, you said was similar to the uh, BMW 1 Series. I was wondering if uh, we've been reduced to two doors being simply show cars. Thank you. Oh. One of those cars is going into production, maybe both, but one for sure. That's I mean, we got two doors, but two doors are a different part of the market than they used to be. Somebody, uh, there's, 
Somebody must know something. That was a nickname I had in high school. Yeah, 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 right. Yeah. Yeah. So, well, exactly. I also figured out who, who Atlas King was, too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that could be one of my buddies in Wisconsin, I suspect. <laughs> But, but, you know, two doors, there was a time we made a two-door sedan of everything. Mm -hmm. And it was quite literally a two-door version where the rear seat accommodation was exactly the same as the sedan. It was just harder to get into and they cost less. That market's gone away, I mean, as far as two-door sedans. And coupes have devolved into vehicles with no rear seats. So this idea of an accommodating coupe was sort of resuscitated really by Scion with the first TC. Because that was a coupe that was a little bit more functional than the other coupes you could buy for the money then. Yeah, what, what I find interesting is two doors just don't sell, not mm -hmm. in big numbers like they used to. And yet every designer in the industry is trying to take their sedan and make it look as much like a two door as they possibly can. Well, they want it to look like a coupe because coupes are fashion, mm -hmm. they're style, and by their very nature, because they're fashion and style, they're always going to be low volume because they're less accommodating. I can, I can perfectly understand that. And let's face it, some companies have done a good job. The, the, the Volkswagen CC, it's that's a good looking car. That's a good looking car. And they had the facelifted car. We get an all new Passat, but they did a facelift on the CC because they really couldn't mess with it a lot. No. And they did a good job on it. Yeah. I mean, yeah. it's a coupe, but it just has four doors. You know, that's the thing. We've got to get used to the concept of a four door coupe now. Yeah. Yeah, which is an oxymoron in Traditionally. my vocabulary. But, but coupes originally, you have to understand the phrase coupe it was from the French word coupe to cut. And originally it meant either lowered roof or shorter wheelbase, because the car was cut from its huh. base form. It may have originally, but you know, over a century it evolved to be in a two-door. Yeah. Is a, is a coupe or a coupe. Yeah. Okay, we got another call. Let's bring it in, Ben. John, my name is Dan Sutherland. I'm calling from Sault Ste. Marie in Ontario. My comment is simply that I have to strongly agree with uh, John DiLorenzo on the new look of the uh, Fusion. I think it's just stunningly a handsome car, and frankly, I think it it's going to really shake things up, and I've read in a Ford press release that they're moving some of the production back to the Flat Rock, Michigan plant. Great news, great news. And as far as the Sonata goes, frankly, I think it's overstyled to the point of being somewhat gaudy. This new Fusion is, is absolutely a winner, and it's going to eat up a lot of um, Camry and Accord market share. That's my comment. Thank you. Goodbye. Yeah, we appreciate the comment, and I, I think he makes a good point. You know, Camry and Accord, they're going to have a hard time fighting back to where they were. Oh, yeah. and I think if, if they can even get there. I think it's going to be tougher for Accord because Accord, as you know, over the years, has, Accord used to be up there duking it out with Camry, and it got to the point where they were no longer doing that. And, you know, and, and the truth is, if the new Accord is any indication, I think they're going to have a tough time next year, or the next year they bring the car out. Stephen Dargell or Dargell says, uh, what would be a 40 mile per gallon combined unadjusted mileage in city highway MPGs? Oh, I know what he's getting at because the Dodge Dart is actually officially classified as 40 miles per gallon combined. Preliminary number, yeah. Unadjusted. Correct. So unadjusted means uh, the EPA came out with the tests and over the years, they've been adding fudge factors. Because the test is an irrelevant test. Because the test really did not accurately and you reflect can't, you, you what can't, you would get in the real world. And you can't drive it anymore. The, the physical test, if you try to drive it, you're either going too fast at some times or too slow on others. Right. See, the drive is actually, and it was an LA loop, 73 miles, I right. think. Um, but the, yeah, the adjustment factors were to try to get the mileage more cl or closer to real, real world. Right. So that's why, what they it's mean a, by adjusted right. that is number. using the original data. The, the, right. the, and you see, the interesting thing is the unadjusted data is the certification data. Correct. So, and the label data is yeah. for marketing. Right, so right, right. the car will get to the EPA for CAFE 41 uh, combined. Right. But the label won't say 41 combined. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> it's very complicated, but I, I will give uh, this to the EPA. That combined number is awfully accurate for the vast majority Correct. of people. Yes. For yeah. the vast majority. Yeah. Unless you're living at high altitude or with the new adjustments. big hills. Or the adjustments day. that came in three years ago. Correct. Yeah, yeah, it's getting they're, very they're close. Pretty, they're pretty accurate. Okay, uh, Ben, let's bring in uh, the next phone call here. Hi, my name is David Lopez. I'm calling from Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. I love the show. And uh, I just wanted to know do you think Ford should? market the C-Max as its own brand, like the Prius is going with Toyota. Love to hear your thoughts. Thanks. 
Oh, good question. Yeah, should Ford market the C-Max as its own brand as Toyota's going to do with the Prius? They're not advertising the Toyota as its own brand. They, 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 it, that's, that is such a misnomer. The, to, the Prius is now a range of cars, just as Corolla was. Mm -hmm. But the commercials still talk about it being a Toyota. They're not saying Prius without saying Toyota. It's a model. And in that respect, the C-Max is the same. It's a model of a Ford. It's right. a C-Max. And they're not calling it a Focus C-Max. Right. It's a C-Max. But it's one kind, it's one configuration of car. The C-Max is one body style that they have, you know, a, a plug-in and non-plug-in version. So it's really a powertrain variation on one car. Prius now has, or will soon have, three different vehicles in the range, which is back when Corolla had a sedan, a wagon, and a hatchback. Right. They're body styles. It's not a brand. Do you think they'll take it to be a brand? No, no. No, because the, the whole point of uh, Toyota is smart enough to understand that you need to support Toyota, the major company, by selling these highly, these highly known models, but you still support Toyota with it. And you can see where they haven't had that luxury with Scion, in that Scion is a series of branded cars and not a strong Scion brand. Good. Do we have any more, Ben? If we have another phone call, let's bring that in. Yeah, John, this is Rick from San Diego. Hey, based on that recent survey on the turbo diesel cars showing they had a better percentage sales increase than hybrids, of course, the hybrids did have the Japanese tra tragedy that affected the Prius sales, but do you think we've finally turned the corner and we're going to start seeing some uh, diesel cars in the U.S. market? Thanks. Yeah, absolutely. No question about it. Chrysler, even though they had announced it sometime before, they reaffirmed at the Detroit show, the Jeep Grand Cherokee, Grand Cherokee. is going to get a diesel. It's going to be a diesel in the Cruze. Right. Chevy Cruze. Yep. Right. Uh, there are going to be more diesels, but as far as the pe total penetration of diesels, I don't think it's going to increase a lot. I think you're going to find people moving cars around that want diesels. Because this happened when... You, <laughs> I don't agree. I think that we're going to see more diesels. And when you look at the take rates on certain model lines in Audi, they're over 50%. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's far better than what Like in the A3, models. for example, right? Well. How many A3s do they sell? Yeah, well, not a whole lot. That's yeah. right. Yeah, see, that's why when you see percentage increase, which is what he's talking about, mm -hmm. the fewer you have, you know, if I have five of anything and suddenly I get six. Ooh. Yeah, it's a big increase. Yeah, okay. Right. But if I had 8,000 and suddenly I see 9,000, I haven't had as big an increase. Mm -hmm. So the percent increase is a misnomer. You're going to see more diesel cars. There's no doubt about it. There's going to be more variation. But remember, when Mercedes, remember Mercedes at one time, every Mercedes they sold was a diesel except the SL for a couple of years. It was, it was not good because their diesels were okay, but they weren't that good. And when they started dropping Mercedes diesels, Volkswagen found out that a lot of buyers that were hardcore diesel buyers that bought Mercedes were buying Jetta diesels. Now, you know, would anybody else in the, rain, in the world have gone from a Mercedes, say, an E-Class sedan to a Jetta? No. These guys were chasing diesel engines. We've talked about this. The market pull for diesels is not there yet. I don't agree. I, I think it's, uh, well, it, it, when you say it's not there yet, we, we have to define what you mean by not there yet. I, I think that there's going to be growing demand for diesel engines. I think you're going to see more manufacturers bring it in. We mentioned uh, the Jeep. We mentioned Chevrolet. Mazda's bringing diesel to the yeah, U.S. Yeah, but stop there. Too. Chevy's doing it with no demand for a diesel cruise. They're just testing the waters. Exactly. But that's my point. And to think that the cars will create the market is only half the equation. You've got to have some harmonization of diesel fuel pricing compared to gasoline. Well, on a national basis, it that ain't would there, help. John. It's not that there. That would help. But, you know, as, as if you, you know. Pay, if you pay more for the fuel uh -huh. and the car is more expensive to, bring, to, to get, and you look at the, the fuel economy they're getting with some gasoline-powered cars, the payoff for the cars from a, from a cost standpoint ain't there. You've got to buy it for the attributes. Well, actually, and there are people that do buy diesels for the attributes. They launch right. great because they got all that torque. Mid-range on a diesel, spectacular. I love modern diesels. But I also know that that's not enough to make some guy say, yeah, I'm going to pay another 40 cents a gallon for fuel and pay right. more for the car to begin with. Well, as you know, you'll get about 30% better fuel economy, comparable performance to comparable performance. So as long as the price of diesel is not 30% greater than gasoline, you're coming out ahead. And you'll no, get you're it. Not. Price of the car is higher. You have to take that into well, consideration. Well, but so is the residual. So you're going to get it when you sell the thing, too. Diesel, go check diesel cars, man. They're exp used diesel cars. I know. They're expensive. They, they are, but it's not incremental. The, the, the actual percent residual is higher, but you, you, you got to do it on the numbers because you're not, you're not using percentages of dollars when you buy stuff. Using real money. Well, you have I know. to do the calculation. When you do, you find the payoff for diesels is tough to find unless you have significantly uh, closer priced fuels. It's just not there yet. Okay. <laughs> Best in show.
Detroit. Whoa. One car. One car, best in show. Oh, boy. Four, three, <laughs> two, one. Okay, you think about it. I'm going to go to it. And I, I'm going to go to a car we didn't talk a whole lot about, and that was Lexus LFLC. To me, that was a best in show. In fact, it wasn't only my opinion. You know, there's about two dozen designers yeah. who walk the show and vote on the Eyes on Design Best Concept Award. They gave it to the LFLC. I found it significant because heretofore, Toyota has pretty much styled plain vanilla, yeah. dull, boring cars. And that's not the case with the LFLC. I know it's just a concept. It'll never get built. I don't think you could productionize a car like that. But this was also done at Kelty in California. This was Kevin Hunter's way of saying, you think we can't do design? Take a look at this. Take that. So uh, I'm going to go out and say Lexus had the best car there from a concept standpoint from that for, for those reasons. I, I, in that case, you're right. The, LS, the LFLC is probably the most significant car there. And, and also the fact that it's a passionate design from Toyota, and they only do those once every two or three decades. <laughs> and we've seen one. And this so, is the first decade they've done it. Oh, no, no. <laughs> Toyota 2000 GT. Oh, yeah. Okay. okay. I mean, okay, they do I'll it. They can do right, it. Yeah. And when they do it, they do it very well. But, but that was four decades ago. Yeah, but there's some stuff that happened in between. Yeah. Some. Hachiroku. Okay, so you're going to choose what? LFLC. Uh, yeah, I oh, think really? of all the cars there. Um, yeah. Now, the, the, the car that, that caught my attention and that was the most intriguing to me was the damned Model, uh, model C uh, Tesla that had the jump seat in the back of the hatchback <laughs> and the trunk in the front. You know, it's like no engine, no baby. And if you just look at it, you're like, whoa, that's pretty funky. Yeah. And a car that didn't get a lot of attention that actually is, to me, probably a, a really intriguing car is the Bentley Continental 8. I love that car. Uh-huh. You know, they've got a, a much lighter engine in it that still is making serious power. In Europe, it's much lower CO2. It's, it's, that, to me, is a pretty spiffy automobile. Yeah. Okay, let's put the auto extremist on the spot. Best car in show. Best blue sky concept, Lexus. Best concept, uh, MKZ. MKZ to me is not a concept. That's a production car. That is a production car, <laughs> yeah. And Whatever. it's a great production car. In fact, car. I think they've pulled the door handles off it just so they could call it a concept so well, they the can redo the car in New York. And the glass roof. And the glass roof. And the glass roof, right. yeah. 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 Okay, and, and guys. I'll bet you when they show it in New York, it's got a badge on the back that says MKZ. Oh, you think? I oh, bet, I bet it will. I bet oh, it will. Yeah, 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 right. Yep. You would have to do that. Thanks, everybody. Thanks to the Cats. The Cats uh, Deli guys came cats through. Cats Deli guys. guys. Yeah, that, that, what, what a cool package yeah, that is. Yeah, that was pretty Robert good. Robert Albender. Robert Albender is what Chip, our producer, is telling us. Thank you very much. Thank you, Robert. Very Tasty, nice. yummy. Yeah. Okay, folks, so uh, join us again here next week. We're going to have Carl Ludvigsen Skyping in from uh, London. Carl E. Ludvigsen. Oh, Carl E. Okay, just so you don't confuse him. With somebody, no, his byline was always Carl E. Ludwigson. Oh, okay. He's a good egg. Very interesting guy, yeah. He, he's a lot of fun. I wonder if he still owns that Lancia Stratos. Oh, he had a Stratos? He had a yellow Stratos. Took me for a ride around Regent's Park in London with it. It was the highlight of that trip over there. I was like, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> so remember, you can friend us at Facebook. You can follow us on Twitter. You can get all of Peter's stuff at autoextremist.com. Follow him on Twitter, too. And... Uh, don't forget about our roundabout tomorrow night. Uh, I hope you liked our auto show coverage. It was pretty good, I thought. And uh, don't forget, you can always subscribe for our newsletter for free. Just check it out on our website at autoline.tv. Anyway, over and out, folks. Thanks much. And if you like this auto extreme auto sweatshirt. Autoline After Hours is. Oh, damn. Try again. Go, go ahead, ahead, Peter. Go ahead. And if you like this Auto Extremist sweatshirt, you can go to AutoExtremist.com and check out our new Auto Extremist store. I'm going to check that out. That's a spiffy t-shirt, too. It's purple. Well, not the shirt. But... Okay, Ben, sorry. Auto Line After Hours is brought to you by Bridgestone, your journey, our passion. And by Chevrolet, the all-new Chevrolet Cruze. Get used to more. Memories is that the production part, Jim? It's like you're kidding. Did you, have you did you see yeah, it? There's yeah, like yeah. jewelry. Very thin. Thin and the supports. Warm that up? Yeah. No, it's it's all right. I think we've already
No, Max was a real coup for for them. Absolutely. No about it. And, and you know what? He, they actually delayed the car because they were right about to tool some stuff, and he was able to. They were able to change on that car. Not a lot, but it was it was stuff that helped it. Huh. Some stuff was lower body. They had a, a rocker applique and stuff, and the car just looked saggy. And he's like, "It's ready to go." And he said, "Can we change it?" And they said, "Well, what do you want to do?" And he told him, "It's like, yeah, we can change it." Wow. It's a great looking automobile. But you know, now they got to follow through on the whole, the whole Lincoln range. organization. No, I'm saying oh. the organization. You know, I, I keep saying I think they need to, to create a. Mm. I, okay, they've got their own studio. Mm. That's nice. I think they need their own organization. I agree, but you know, that ain't going to happen. That's the problem. The, I, I have friends that have been working on the Lincoln stuff, and they say it's, it's all important until it comes to time for a decision that involves Ford, and then fall, Ford, just like always, becomes the dominant partner. Yeah. No, I think, uh, you know, Volkswagen is the example. How they run Audi. It's vertically integrated. It's a, it's a totally standalone organization. Yep. And uh, with its own P&L, yep. annual report, board of directors, stock, right. the whole nine yards. And uh, boy, I'd love to see Ford do that with Lincoln. Won't happen. You know why it won't happen? Because they don't think they need to do it, number and one. That, that's one, and the other one is the Ford family itself. Well, they can still be the majority owners in it. They can be the only owners of it. But, sure. But I don't think they think they need to do it. You know, bring back Edsel the first. He'd go for it because that's how they had it as the Lincoln Motor Company. I know. Well, they, because they bought it. True. True. But even up through the 50s, it had its own headquarters, its own engineers, its own right. plant. Then they had the Continental Division for a while. Is that right? Continental Division? Then they had MEL. Yeah, Mercury, Mel. Ed, Mercury Edsel Lincoln. I mean, they went through so many changes once they started figuring out exactly what to do with it. And then when it became, you know, basically a cast off. I mean, remember, in 57, 58, Mercury had its own dedicated bodies. Wow. Weren't sure, they weren't shared with Ford, but they were shared on the two top line Edsels. Hmm. Weren't shared with Lincoln. They were their own cars. That's why the commitment to Lincoln they've done before. And my concern is there's, no, there's nothing that guarantees Lincoln is going to still be considered this important in, in seven or eight years. The only thing that will make them think it's that important is if it starts to really generate profit. Absolutely correct. But that's also a danger because if it starts generating a lot of profit, they're going to go, oh, have we got this figured out? Exactly. And they won't evolve it. Right. Mm -hmm. I've gotten into interesting discussions with guys that say that Lincoln will never work until they have a rear drive platform. Oh, I heard that today. And you know what I say? Just like, because they say, they say, if you have a flagship, thank you, sir, if you have a flagship, it has to be rear drive. And I think, yeah, just like Audi with the A8, it has to be rear drive, you know? <laughs> no, a flagship is a flagship, okay? It's made of the right components, and it has the right presence. That's what it's about. And which end drives it? It's academic. Well, the only thing is, I still think that you can do rear drive and get it just about as fuel efficient as front drive. Oh, to me, it's not fuel efficient. It's, it's an issue of economies of scale of transmissions and stuff like that. That's, that's where the cost is. Mm -hmm. And that's why, you know, Audi doesn't need a rear drive sedan, a rear drive architecture. They've got it dialed in now. I mean, think about it. At Bentley, there are two vehicle architectures. There's a front drive based one and a rear drive based one. Mm -hmm. They're both right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're right. You know, as long as you're going to go all wheel drive, what the heck? And, and at right. Lincoln, it looks like they are. Yeah, it does. I mean, so I mean, I, I, I don't think they need, but what they need are some dedicated components that are premium for that car that don't get thrown into every Ford. Right. That's why there's something about the ATS that it, to me is like fingernails on a chalkboard, and I wanted to talk about it, and I forgot about it. Yeah, I did too. And you know what it is? What? The normally aspirated 2.5 liter engine in that car. That's a car where you've got to check every box that the competition has. And don't do anything that seems irrational compared to what the competition does, even if it's a better idea right now, because this is establishing the car in arguably the toughest segment of the luxury market to crack. Yes. The volume. Yes. And nobody is running normally aspirated four-cylinder engines. No one. And they're not going to. BMW is going to, during the life cycle on the, on the 3 Series, they're going to take the displacement down on that car to 1.7 liters. But it's going to be turbocharged 1.7. Mm -hmm. It's going to happen during the, probably in a uh, year 4 and year 5. But the normally aspirated four doesn't jibe. And, you know, Dave Leone I like. He's a great guy. And he says, but Jim, we're making 202 horsepower. I said, you know, it's not horsepower. 
turbocharged four, turbocharged four, V6, V6. And I know why they're doing it. There's just something about the ATS, something not there. They're, the reason they're doing it is optimizing profit, profit on the platform because Ackerson has to get the profitability of the company up to get the share of the stock value up so they can sell off the rest of the share. I mean, it, it keeps coming back to that. And the motivation's wrong. It's not about making the right car. Mm -hmm. That's why they did the headcount reductions in, uh, in engineering. Mm -hmm. It's profitability. It's why they're, right. they're running the, the, the air conditioning systems all at you know, less heat. You know about this? No. Yeah. Oh, Lord. What? Yeah, the tech center. The buildings are colder. Oh, oh, oh yeah. Oh, I, no, I thought you were talking about the cars. No, 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 no. At the buildings, it's it's to it's to mm. get. They're trying to squeeze every bit of money they can yeah. so the profitability looks better. Yeah. Well, oh, no, oh. to me, it's crazy that they complain of having a uh, a shortage of technical good technical people on mm -hmm. one hand, and then talk about laying off all these engineers on the other. No argument. And and you know what they're going to do? They're going to lay them off here and hire them in China. That's the problem I've got with that move. But that's, that's, that's a problem, and that, that's, that's my concern with the ATS. I love the way the ATS looks. I actually do. It's, it, it, it looks different, but it looks like Cadillac family stuff, but pisses me off. In the saving money deal, you know what car they just canceled? Or put on indefinite hold is the ATS convertible. Hey, we've got a call real quick. You're going to want to listen to it. Then. Okay. Yeah, Ben, Craig, one of you guys. It's Bob Hall. I mean, that was King. No, I mean Bob Hall. Um, if you can poke your head in with Jim, ask him why anybody was asking, why is, would anybody be taking bombs to a submarine? It will make him laugh and it will drive him crazy. Bye. Attaching bombs to a submarine? Why would anyone be taking bombs to a submarine? <laughs> We're not on anymore, are we? No. Okay. No. 